Hey guys, I'm Dov, and today I'm back once again with another Total War Warhammer 2 Faction Overview. It's been quite a while since I've done one of these, uh, so for those of you who haven't seen my other Faction Overviews, this will be included with a, in a playlist with the rest. Uh, and Basically, I just go over the roster here, um, and this is meant for players playing as the Dwarves and playing against the Dwarves. Obviously, we are doing the Proud Dawi today. So, uh, yeah, we're going to start with some uh, general traits of the Dawi. Just kind of go over a quick overview of the army, and then I'm going to touch on each of the units individually, what they do. And then at the end, we'll sort of go through some sample builds, how to play as the dwarves, and how to play against the dwarves. So, starting in right uh, with the sort of general overview, dwarves are, well, dwarves. They're, uh, they're stout, stocky, sturdy resilient and a bit slow. Um, their faction is generally, well, it entirely lacks any sort of cavalry uh, or monsters. It has only a couple of mobile war machines. The rest of the army is all infantry, skirmisher, infantry, and artillery. So uh, very limited in terms of the types of units they can bring, but obviously being uh, very limited in that selection, they have some of the best, if not the best, infantry uh, infantry skirmishers and artillery in the game. Uh, let's get started with Dawi leadership. Definitely one of the weakest points of the Dawi roster in my opinion, and an opinion probably shared by many others as well. Uh, dwarf lords all just, um, well, they're not great because they're infantry only lords. So generally they lack a lot of the uh, flexibility and uh, toolkit that a lot of other lords for other factions can bring. So starting out here with the regular Dwarf Lord, your Bog Basic, uh, Foe Seeker, Stand Your Ground, which uh, because the Dawi generally have high leadership in melee defense anyway, this isn't really that necessary of an ability. Likewise, the Extra Vigor can be nice, but he has another item that helps with that. And uh, yeah, this 24% uh, speed isn't super impactful for someone with only 30 speed to begin with, so I will typically cut both of those. Uh, now for the items here, this Iron Warden's Hammer is the one I was talking about, does give him perfect Perfect Vigor. His leadership is above 50%, which is not too bad, especially in a long grindy game. In a late game situation, can make him very tough to take down. Um, he's also got the Star Metal Plate, which gives an area of effect minus 9 melee attack. Again, not the most impactful because Dawi generally have high melee defense. You don't necessarily need to debuff your uh, opponent's melee attack too much, but definitely a nice uh, item to have. In terms of his general traits, uh, very, very sturdy. High armor, high melee defense, uh, not the best weapon strength, but decent weapon strength. Uh, not the best AP values, but decent AP values. No charge bonus whatsoever, but he does have expert charge defense, which means he uh, is uh, he will negate the charge bonus of both infantry and large sized targets. So a very resilient and cheap option overall, especially if you cut all of his abilities, only a thousand points. This is going to be one of your go-to picks. Um, just because he's so cheap, it allows you to go nice and wide. Moving on, next up we've got Belagar Iron Hammer, who uh, has got some, some successive buffs and honestly isn't too bad. Considering his cost, uh, he does bring some nice toolkit abilities to the table. Rally I'll typically cut because, again, extra leadership isn't super necessary with the Dawi. This Mighty Oath Stone is a very nice ability uh, to pair with certain units that we'll see later on. It gives expert charge defense. Again, that's charge defense against all, meaning both infantry and cavalry. Uh, large and small, and extra melee defense, which is a very good ability and a pretty good area of effect, makes him uh, sort of the tank archetype lord, uh, legendary lord that is. He's also got Revenge Incarnate to give himself a huge damage spike, uh, extra weapon damage, a huge amount of extra weapon damage, melee attack and leadership, makes him into a pretty scary duelist and lasts almost a full minute. So a very strong ability there. And uh, Hammer of Angrind, likewise, will give him a constant buff, uh, just a little bit of extra uh, weapon damage, melee attack, attack and charge bonus. So he is a pretty good duelist all things considered. 60 melee attack, 55 defense, has 120 armor with a 55% missile block chance. So he's sort of just like a better version of the regular Dwarf Lord. Slightly less melee defense, but he brings uh, some nice attributes to the table. With that Mighty Oath Stone in particular uh, can be used with some certain units very well. Uh, Revenge Incarnate, and yeah, Hammer of Angrind and Revenge Incarnate probably aren't super necessary. If you want to cheap them out as much as possible, you can just take the Mighty Oath Stone. But uh, 
if you were to cut that, even then, he's only 100 points more expensive than the Dwarf Lord, and he does have also uh, quite a bit more HP as well, about 500 more HP, which is pretty significant, all things considered. So, Belagar, definitely a pretty decent pick as well, not one you see super often, but uh, I think he's a little bit of an underrated pick, certainly. Uh, next up is the Rune Lord, another very, very common pick. Rune Lord is one of the few, uh, he's sort of your quote-unquote caster type lord. I know the dwarves don't technically use magic, but he does have a number of support abilities um, that make him marginally more useful than many of the other dwarf lords. Um, looking at things here, he does have a mount option, the Anvil of Doom, which comes with a few uh, extra abilities. It makes him a large size target. Um, baseline, he doesn't have the best stats, and you can see up on the... Uh, Anvil of Doom does, does give him a bit of extra HP and leadership, a higher melee defense as well, and higher charge bonus for some reason, which is just hilarious. Um, and it also gives him physical resistance and uh, an additional ability that we will have a look at here. This is the Locus of Power. It gives map-wide 15% magic resistance. So against certain factions, this actually can be very useful. Um, I, in particular against like the Skaven, let's say, having that extra magic resistance because a lot of their armor-piercing units do magic damage. Uh, you can really get some pretty good value from that. Uh, one thing I failed to mention in the initial overview, dwarves all have a baseline magic resistance of 25% as a whole, because the faction doesn't have magic at all. They don't believe in it, so they get a bit of a resistance to it, right? Um, so, uh, moving on, back to the Rune Lord. Um, his quote-unquote spells, if you will, his abilities here. He has an extra area of effects, 10% armor piercing, constant, which is okay, it's not amazing, but uh, I'll typically cut this for cost. Area of effect, immune to psychology. This can be good if you're running a very wide low tier stack, but in general, again, due to cost, uh, you know, optimization, I'll usually cut this. A lot of dwarf units generally have high leadership and are immune to psychology anyway, so terror routing isn't typically a huge issue. Uh, Rune of Oath and Steel, again, because dwarves generally have higher any high armor anyway, and after 100 armor you start to hit diminishing returns, um, you know, and past 200 it's just completely useless to have more. So, in general I would say you can cut this, um, and it's not going to be too big of an issue. These two are the main ones that I would say are the most important. Master Rune of Wrath and Ruin is a 48% speed debuff, and it does a pretty good amount of damage to multi-model uh, units. Very useful for debuffing like cavalry, chariots, even single entity models if you need to. Big scary monsters and lords and so on, you can use this to debuff their speed. Layer that in with a couple of other deep speed debuffs and really kind of slow your opponent down so that you can catch them and kill them. Of course, Master Rune of Negation, pretty expensive, but 44% damage res resistance for 18 seconds is a pretty significant... Uh, it doesn't last a super long time. I do wish it would last a little bit longer, but 44% damage resistance is a pretty serious uh, amount of tankiness. And then for his other items here, he gets uh, an additional 33% damage resistance on himself um, if he gets below 20% HP, which is a decent... Um, item to take if you're worried about getting Lord sniped. And then the Master Rune of Grungni, again, extra physical, uh, sorry, missile resistance for himself and an area of effect. If you do take him up on the anvil and you're concerned about him getting shot up, you can take that and it'll give him, uh, you know, a bit of extra missile resistance there. Although still not going to be, oh, what is that? What would that be? 35% total? Still not amazing, but like against the Skaven, for example, you'll be getting that uh, that locus of power, plus the magic resistance, plus if you take the extra missile resistance, you'll be basically immune to uh, things like warp lightning cannons, so can be potentially useful there, or against the Empire, against things like Witch Hunters, and, uh, you know, Hammer of Witches, the Silver Bullets, things like that, he'll be very resistant if you kid him out properly. But uh, Rune Lord in general, you'll often see with just uh, on foot, with just the Master Rune of Wrath and Ruin, for only a thousand points, does give him some decent utility, and he's reasonably tanky being a dwarf, so it definitely can stand for a while. The best fighter, though, by far and away, is Ungrim Iron Fist. Not super expensive, um, but he is an absolute world beater. 70 melee attack, huge weapon strength with armor piercing, and a 35 bonus versus large. 120 armor, again, he's unbreakable. He's a slayer, so he will never rout. Uh, has a 50 charge bonus, which is a lot for a dwarf, certainly. And uh, his abilities are sort of all meant to augment him as a duelist, um, as a kind of a world beater. He has death blow, so if his health gets super low, um, 
you're going to get a bit of a extra damage there. I don't find this to be super impactful because generally you don't want Ungrim getting that low on HP anyway. Uh, Foe Seeker we've seen before. It might be useful to have the Vigor Refresh. Deadly Onslaught is actually pretty nice for him considering he has good weapon strength already. Uh, Red Ruin... Uh, gives minus 27 melee defenses, which is pretty painful, but it does give him a huge damage spike. Especially if you use these two in tandem, you're going to be getting, uh, what, 80% total weapon and armor piercing damage, so you can get close to doubling that up. If you bring the Axe of Dargo, you can actually more than double um, the uh, weapon strength there, and give an additional plus 32 bonus versus large. So, uh, Ungrim, if he can get a... The, and now, the issue with Ungrim is he's an infantry-only lord, only 32 speed, pretty slow. But if he can get a hold of a large target with all of those buffs active, he will tear them apart. Absolutely scary. Um, and being unbreakable, of course, does help in that uh, aspect, fighting big monsters as well. But still, generally... Uh, even like cheaped out Ungrim, you might see sometimes. For only 1350, he's unbreakable and has uh, that bonus versus large. So, in certain matchups where you're going to be facing a lot of big, zombie monsters, rather than taking a Lord or Belagar or, you know, one of the other cheaper options, just take a cheaped, cheaped out uh, Ungrim, and he can definitely be pretty good. Grom Brindle, unfortunately, is just a little bit expensive for what he gives you. He does have some good abilities here. The Flash Bomb in particular, a minus 76 speed and minus 27 melee defense is actually pretty nice. I haven't really tried this too much since they uh, since they changed it, but it had only last 16 seconds. And again, you have to get relatively close with Grom Brindle to be able to even use it, but he's just kind of expensive for what you get out of him. I mean, granted, he does do a ton of damage. No, burner, no bonus versus large, but 500 total weapon strength baseline. He does do magic damage as well, which is kind of nice in some matchups. He has expert charge defense, and he also has this uh, Grom Brindle has no fear. You don't have to pay for this. He just comes with it uh, naturally. A one-time use map-wide makes all the dwarves unbreakable. Uh, it's, it's decent, but again, because the dwarves already are a pretty high leadership faction. Uh, of leadership effects aren't going to be as useful for them as they would be for other factions. Now, let's say you're in a 2v2 with a Skaven army or, you know, Bretonia or something that has uh, generally poor leadership, then all of a sudden this ability becomes insanely more useful uh, because map-wide unbreakable means it will affect your allies as well. Um, but in a 1v1 situation, I really don't see uh, Grom Brindle having as much of a use as the other lords, unfortunately. In terms of his items here, he has the Rune Axe of Grom Brindle, which gives 40% AP and a Discourage effect, which would be nice if the dwarves had some terror units, but they don't, so, eh, it's all, it's okay, it's not amazing. Um, the Rune Helm of Zuffbar, again, that, uh, that extra leadership effect for the Dawi just isn't that helpful, um, because they already have generally very high leadership, it's not... It's not super impactful for them to have that kind of a, an ability, so yeah, Grombrindle's good, don't get me wrong, but he is just more expensive and he suffers from the same infantry-only lord syndrome that all the other dwarf lords suffer from, so yeah, not not the best pick, but certainly a fun pick, especially in 2v2s. Uh, now, Thorgrim Grudgebear is going to be the uh, most expensive, and he does come with quite a few abilities, but again, just not... Ah, <sighs> not the best. Uh, let's see here. We'll start with this one. High King. Okay, this is similar to the beloved Son of Bretonia for Lewin, in that it's... Its conditions mean that you're almost never going to get value from this ability. Um, it's basically useless, because to get it to go off... Um, it's, uh, let's see, it is map-wide, but you... Your units have to be above 50% leadership. Okay, so that your your the units in your army that are potentially going to be affected by this, they have to be above 50% leadership. But your lord, meaning Ungrim himself, has to be below 50% leadership. Okay, so there's two conditions that you have to fulfill there, which are a bit mutually exclusive. Generally, if Thorgrim is below 50% HP, something's going terribly wrong, and chances are a lot of your units aren't going to be above 50% leadership. So. Eh, the effect itself isn't even that impactful. Plus 8 melee attack, a bit of charge bonus. Immune to psychology is okay, but again, we've already kind of discussed it's not wildly useful for the dwarves. And a bit of extra weapon damage, it's really just this ability is just useless in my opinion. I would cut it 9 times out of 10. You're almost never ever going to get value from this, in my opinion. It's just... Uh, yeah, Creative Assembly really needs to adjust, uh, adjust this ability and Beloved Son of Bretonia to get rid of one of the, those two conditions. Um, just get rid of the leadership condition uh, and just make it so that if Thorgrim is below 50% HP, all of them get that buff. Just 
baseline, right? Um, because as it is right now, because it's doubly conditional, you're almost never going to get value from this, especially because of the, the specific conditions. Again, they are a bit mutually exclusive. So, uh, Foe Seeker we've seen before, not great for the Dwarves. Oath of Vengeance is okay. It does give a single target minus 27 melee defense for 44 seconds, which is a pretty long time. Uh, it's definitely decent for, you know, focusing high value single targets, but generally you're going to be focusing them with missiles rather than melee attacks anyway, so... Uh, Again, not the best. Same thing with standard ground. So, oh, okay. So four, uh, four out of the five abilities for for Thorgrim are just not very useful. And then the Great Book of Grudges is absolutely plus nine melee attack, and an area of effect is awesome for the dwarves, considering they don't have a ton of melee attack buffs, um, and their melee attack is generally a bit low. So, yeah. Great Book of Grudges, definitely a good ability, but that's basically the only reason to bring Thorgrim, and he's significantly more expensive than the other Dwarf Lords that you could bring, and Dawi generally in the current meta want to go as wide as possible, so yeah, Thorgrim, definitely just a fun pick. In most competitive matches, you'll want to leave him at home. Moving on to the heroes, we've got the Thane, Foe Seeker, and Deadly Onslaught. Eh, Deadly Onslaught's not that great for him because his weapon of strength isn't that high to begin with. Uh, he does have some okay abilities. This Ironbeard's Ring actually can be... Um, Used with some good synergy, particularly um, blasting charges do fire damage. You've got your Warriors of Dragonfire Pass that do fire damage, Iron Drakes do fire damage, uh, Gyrocopters with Brimstone Guns do fire damage, and of course, Flame Cannons. So, you do have a number of units on your roster that can do fire damage. So, having this ability here, this Iron Beard's Ring, can give you a bit of extra value from that, um, depending on what kind of build you're bringing or who you're up against, it can be useful to have. Not super game-breaking, but uh, this Rune of Slowness is something they just added in the Festag update. It's decent. 18% speed isn't great, but if you were to combine this with Rune of Wrath and Ruin, then, of course, you're going to be getting, you know, double layering speed debuffs, and you'll be getting, what, close to 90% uh, speed debuffed. So, yeah, yeah. In that aspect, I think it might be useful to have. It is a passive, so you don't really have to do anything. You just have the Thane stand around, and he'll be debuffing. The Silver Horn of Vengeance is just completely useless as an item and should be taken out of the game, um, because charge bonus on dwarves is just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Uh, moving on, we've got the Rune Smith. Pretty much the same thing as the Rune Lord here. Forge Fire, you can cut. Rune of Oath and Steel, you can almost always cut. Rune of Wrath and Ruin and Rune of Negation are the two that you should consider. And usually you'll just want to take him with uh, Rune of Wrath and Ruin to debuff your opponent's speed and to uh, do a bit of damage as well. His other abilities here, Hammer of Karak Draz, actually can be useful against certain factions. It is a huge melee attack debuff, but again, you're generally want to, going to want to be doing your damage in uh, at range. Although, you know, if you're getting heavily gooned or something, maybe it's useful to have this to shut down a high value unit. But again, just because of the way the meta works, you're going to want to go wide with the dwarves and take your heroes as cheap as possible. And again, we have another useless leadership debuff. Or, sorry, buff. So, yeah. They definitely need to readdress a lot of the lords' skills, um, in my opinion. The dwarves' heroic core is probably one of the worst in the game, in my opinion. Um, there are a few bright spots, but generally, I mean, the, the leadership buffs and the charge bonus thing for the Thane is just, yeah. And, like, all of almost all of Thorgrim's abilities are just not impactful, so... Yeah, I would really like them to see see them readdress some of those things. But moving on, last one here, we've got the Engineer. Uh, he does have an armor-piercing missile attack, has a little bit of armor-piercing melee strength. Not the most, but it's uh, 220 armor-piercing and melee is not terrible. Has okay combat stats, 120 armor. Not the most HP in the world, but uh, mainly he's here to support your missile units. He does have the extra powder, which gives extra explosion and AP explosion in an area of effect. Uh, helps buff up your artillery pieces. Uh, the Ballistics Calibration will give extra accuracy and reload skill to everyone on an active effect. Um, so yeah, that's pretty good. Entrenchment means the unit cannot move, however it gains uh, extra physical resistance and armor-piercing missile damage. So, uh, you know, if you have your, your missile unit in an appropriate place, let's say you have some Thunderers who are getting counterfired, um, you pop that on them, they, they're not going to be able to move, but they'll get a huge damage spike and they'll, uh, from, to their missiles, that is, and they'll get some extra physical resistance, so that's an okay ability. It's not amazing, but um, generally the Engineer, because he's pretty cheap already, can be a good option. Sometimes I'll even take him 
uh, down to be as cheap as possible. He doesn't really have any support abilities, but he can kind of act as a single entity sniper. Probably not going to be as good as bringing a full unit of Thunderers, but he's there. Uh, he also has Prospector Spyglass for additional accuracy, a constant effect in an area effect around him. And the firing of Thori is sort of a breath attack. Doesn't do the most damage in the world, but it's okay. Um, that's pretty much it for the heroes. Again, one of the weakest heroic cores in the, in the game, in my opinion, but hopefully we'll see them address that at a future date. Moving on, we've got the infantry, the nice, big, meaty center of the dwarf army. Starting with the lowly miners. Two variants of miners, one with blasting charges, one without. The one with blasting charges has a single volley of precursor blasting charges that do quite a bit of damage, especially against the low armor units. Can definitely tear them apart and, of course, does a nice explosion. The miners have Vanguard and absolutely crap melee stats. Only 18 attack and defense means they're on par with things like zombies. Um, but they do have 80 armor, which is definitely better than zombies, makes them reasonably resilient against certain types of units, but again, those poor combat stats means that they're really not going to win too many engagements. That being said, they do have some armor-piercing damage, uh, not terrible armor-piercing damage, so if you can get them buffed up or, you know, get them into the rear of an armored unit, they can actually do some decent damage, but uh, yeah, miners, actually with the blasting charges especially, are a nice, nice low-tier option, that 80 armor in particular that they can be a decently cost-effective roadblock. Moving on, we've got two variants of Dwarf Warriors, one with Axe and Shield, one with the Great Axe. So yeah, the Axe and Shield, this is kind of your bread and butter archetypal Dwarven Infantry. Only 450 points for 40 melee defense and 85 armor with a uh, missile block chance as well. They also have charge defense against large. So yeah, just a generally extremely cost-effective uh, defensive unit. Considering they're only 450 points, Dwarf Warriors are probably one of the best low-tier infantry units in the game. Uh, they are just incredibly resilient. They can really stand up to a lot of punishment from uh, higher class units. Granted, they're not gonna dish out a lot of damage, only 28 weapon strength and 22 melee attack, with a pretty low AP of 7, uh, means that they're definitely not going to do a ton of damage, but they will hold and allow your other damage dealing units to get some work done. Oh, just about forgot here. A quick quick note on the miners, they do have a regiment of renowned Ekrans miners, which of course, as well as gaining uh, extra combat stats, does get frenzy, which is actually pretty nice. They also have three volleys of blasting charges rather than just the one. And uh, yeah, I actually think the Ekrans Miners are a little bit of an underrated regiment of renown in my opinion. They, the better combat stats definitely help, especially the Frenzy giving them plus eight melee attack means they'll be at about around 30 melee attack, making them uh, comparable to Dwarf Warriors with great weapons, um, which I guess we can kind of go into them now. They have lower melee defense, but the same melee attack, uh, slightly higher total weapon strength and a higher charge bonus, and of course, no charge defense or missile block chance. So they lose a lot of the defensive uh, attributes with um, yeah, they lose a lot of the def defensive attributes of regular Dwarf Warriors and gain a little bit of armor piercing in, in recompense. They are good in niche matchups where you're expecting a lot of armored infantry, but generally I would say you're better off going with the shielded variant of Dwarf Warriors. But yeah, Ekron's, uh if we go ahead and compare the Dwarf Warriors, the Great Weapons, Ekron's Miners have lower melee defense and lower total weapon strength, but again, they have that uh, those blasting charges and the frenzy effect will kick in as well and increase their melee attack and weapon strength uh, even more. So I do think the Ekron's Miners are going to be actually a pretty reasonably cost-effective unit. Uh, not something you see super often, but uh, moving on, we've got uh, Regiment of Renown, Dwarf Warriors. We go ahead and compare them. Warriors of Dragonfire Pass is significantly more expensive, but of course they do gain a few nice attributes. Probably the best thing is this bonus versus infantry of plus six. It's not amazing, but for a unit that already doesn't have the greatest melee attack, that means against infantry-sized targets, they'll be hitting at 33 melee attack, which is pretty solid. You know, that's on par with, like, Empire State troops, which are very cost-effective troops. Uh, the extra fire damage, again, can be useful in these situations if they're fighting a unit that's weak to it. Um, but yeah, 700 points, very uh, good defensive uh, low-tier unit. Um, the next sort of tier up is the Longbeards, so we've got two variants of them with a Regiment of Renown. The Shielded variant, again, same kind of dichotomy here, although it is worth noting that Longbeards with Great Weapons have Charge Defense against Large, whereas Dwarf Warriors with Great Weapons do not. So that is an important note, the Longbeards with Great Weapons are actually a very good counter cavalry unit because of their armor piercing and that charge defense. They also have a 16 charge bonus, which is uh, better than 10, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, 
Longbeards at 650 are, again, a very cost-effective defensive unit, going to be a little bit better than the uh, Dwarf Warriors, in addition to just having better stats. They also have immunity to psychology, which is super, super nice to have. They also have encourage, which means if for whatever reason you lose your leadership units, these Longbeards will act as leadership type units and give that encourage aura in an area of effect. Uh, very useful to layer in a couple of Longbeards in with your other cheaper troops to give them that uh, leadership effect. The Great Weapons do have lower melee defense, but the uh, the Grumbling Guard here, the Regiment of Renown version, of course, does make up for that in being a Regiment of Renown. And it also has this effect here, Old Grumblers. So it'll, uh, every 5 seconds, or sorry, every 25 seconds, it gives a Vigor Refresh of 9% in a 40 meter uh, area of effect. Makes them able to help sustain your, uh, your defensive units. They can fight longer and stay fresher. Vigor, especially uh, for the Dwarves, because you're going to be trying to wear your opponent down, and oftentimes you're happy to chase a lot of units around the battlefield and just, you know, kind of waddle around, having that bigger refresh can be extremely useful. Uh, they're a little bit expensive at 1,000 points, uh, but definitely a useful unit to have in certain builds. Moving on, we've got the Elite Boys. Slayers are your first sort of elite choice. They come in uh, two variants, Regular Slayers with a Regiment of Renown and Giant Slayers. So Regular Slayers are going to be uh, dual wielding axes. They do have a missile block chance because they can, I guess, block missiles with their axes, which is super cool. Uh, they're, being Slayers, they're unbreakable and they have a bonus versus large. So this is your kind of anti-large damage dealer unit. Uh, 24 bonus versus large is pretty significant. 16 AP is also quite good on a quote-unquote non-AP unit. They are also pretty fast for dwarves at 40 speed. Great combat stats. And uh, yeah, just generally a very, very strong unit. Once their HP gets below a certain amount, they will also gain a damage spike with pretty high base weapon strength anyway. Uh, the Dragonback Slayers, the Regiment of Renown, just gain a few extra effects. They have physical resistance of 20%, so they are a bit tankier than your regular Slayers. Um, they have this ability here, Power of the Dragon Bla Dragon Back. So they will uh, imbue an additional weakness to fire and uh, they themselves have flame resistance and they will slow down your enemy. So there's a lot to kind of digest there. The flame resistance is eh. It means that if, if your slayers are fighting something and like the flame cannon shooting in or let's say iron drakes are shooting in and they hit the slayers a little bit, it's not going to do as much damage. It's still probably not great to do friendly fire. But uh, giving your opponent extra weakness to fire is nice. We've seen another effect like that. So you can stack those two on top of each other and give 44% uh, weakness to fire. If you're, say, fighting a unit that already has the baseline 25%, then you're looking at a significant weakness to fire and a huge damage spike from certain types of units. Even as is, though, 36% speed debuff alone makes this ability very, very powerful. You can pair this with Rune of Wrath and Ruin or the Thane Slow to really layer on those speed effects and slow down your enemy to your pace. So definitely would say that the Dragonback Slayers are pretty much a must-pick in every single build. The Giant Slayers are the variant of Slayers that has armor piercing. They don't have the missile block chance, um, and they have lower melee defense, but they have better melee attack. Um, slightly lower total weapon strength, but obviously much better armor piercing, and they gain slightly higher charge bonus as well. 33 AP with a 30 bonus versus large. These guys can tear large units apart, but they are relatively squishy for the price at 1250, so you gotta be a bit careful with them. Uh, kind of skipped over hammers a little bit here. They also have a regiment of renowned peak gate guard. Hammers are they're they're good. They're they're not insanely cost effective, but this kind of comes back to Belagar. Uh, hammers sort of lack the defensive stats of let's say Longbeards with great weapons. Let's compare the two. So they don't have charge defense against large. They don't have immune psychology. They don't have encourage. They have uh, less melee defense than Longbeards with great weapons. Although obviously they have much better offensive stats and more health. Um, 
to kind of supplement that though, you can use this Mighty Oath Stone with a Hammerer build to give them that expert charge defense and uh, extra melee defense as well. And this is actually one of the better synergies uh, for Hammerers in my opinion. Definitely makes them more effective, but just Hammerers in a nutshell, uh, they have massive total weapon strength, 55 with 41 AP, so they do do a huge amount of AP damage. They do have 46 melee attack as well, so they can definitely dish out some pain, absolutely. They are a little bit expensive, don't have the most HP in the world for this uh, unit class, and yeah, just generally, I, I, I don't find them to be super cost effective. Again, because the dwarf meta kind of favors going wide anyway, you're not going to see these guys too typically. Uh, the Pete Gate Guard pick up some additional traits, they have armor sundering, they do have immune to psychology, and uh, they also gain magic attacks as well, and of course, being a regiment of renown, they do have better stats. And that's, uh, yeah, that's Hammerers. They're decent, but they're not, again, because of the way the meta works with the Dwarves right now, they're not going to be a super common pick. Uh, last pick is the de best defensive unit in the game, Ironbreakers. Oof, man. 68 melee defense. Holy cow. And with the Regiment of Renown version, that goes up to 86 melee defense. This is, I think, the highest melee defense of any unit in the game. Correct me if I'm wrong, but these guys are ridiculously hard to kill in melee. You pretty much have to use ranged units or shock damage to take care of them, because just with a straight-up melee fight, there's pretty much no units in the game, just about, uh, you know, that can get up to that level of melee attack. But um, in general, they have blasting charges like the miners do. They carry two volleys rather than just one. Um, interesting. The Norgrimlings actually do more damage. I wonder if it's just because they shoot faster. Anyway, shoot in quotations. Um, pretty low melee attack and weapon strength, but the defensive stats are really what you're paying for here. That super high melee defense and expert charge defense means that uh, the, the Iron Breakers will be, again, very, very hard to take down in melee. The Nora Grimlings also gain uh, Vanguard deployment as well and immune to psychology which for whatever reason the regular Iron Breakers don't have, for only 300 points more, they also gain an additional 15 unit models. So, uh, 90 unit models with 86 melee defense and 125 armor that are immune to psychology and have expert charge defense. Now you see why I, why I say this is by far and away the best defensive unit in the game. These guys will hold in melee pretty much forever. Uh, until you hit them with some, you know, some chariots or some shock cav in the rear or hit them with some ranged units. They're going to just stand and fight in melee all day. So, super great unit and uh, actually decent in some, some builds, but we'll move on. Uh, missile infantry. There are obviously quite a few varieties. Let's just quickly go through them. Uh, rangers come in a couple varieties. You have regular rangers, rangers with great weapons, and the Ulthar's raiders. Uh, regular rangers are sort of your, your bog basic. Vanguard deployment and stock, which is nice traits to have for only 500 points. Pretty decent. They do good missile damage as well. They have relatively limited range, all things considered. 160 is good. It's not amazing. Um, the missile damage is pretty decent as well with 4 AP per shot, which is not bad at all. Um, only 40 armor, but they do also have shields, so they can block 35% of incoming, uh, you know, small arms missile fire. So generally, rangers are super cost effective. Probably one of the most cost effective missile units in the game, honestly. They just have so much going for them. A decent-ish melee stats, missile block chance, the stock, vanguard, decent range, decent AP. They're just kind of a great all-around skirmisher. Uh, they are a little bit squishy compared to some of the other dwarf skirmishers, but um, rangers with, with great weapons, unfortunately, they do obviously lose out that shield. Um, they don't have the missile block chance, but they do armor piercing and melee. They also have uh, just slightly better uh, melee attack. They do have worse melee defense, uh, but of course gain armor piercing, and they also have throwing axes rather than a crossbow, so they have significantly less range, but they do a huge amount of armor piercing damage. Uh, they can do a ton of burst damage up close, 26 AP per axe, with a pretty quick refire rate means that they can dish out a ton of damage very quickly. Uh, they just have to get nice and close, which can be dangerous, but uh, Ulthar's Raiders are the Regiment of Renown. Extra 100 points, they pick up this uh, Marked by Ulthwar ability, which will give um, negative missile parry. So if you're throwing those axes at like a unit of Chosen with Shields, for example, or anything with Shields, you can throw that uh, negative missile parry on them so that they won't block 
the missiles as effectively. Also gives uh, minus missile resistance and minus armor as well. That minus armor in particular you can use not only for ranged attacks, but also for, you know, melee engagements as well, obviously. Um, but yeah, Ulthar's Raiders, definitely very cost effective. You will see them in quite a few uh, builds. But uh, sort of the counterpoint to Rangers is Quarrelers. They don't have Vanguard, and they're a little bit more expensive, but they have armor. So 80 armor on a skirmisher unit is really, really nice to have. Of course, they have shields as well, and they also have a great weapon variant. No cross, no uh, throwing axes on these guys. They also have the crossbows, but of course, AP and no missile block chance with less melee defense. Um, range is the same, and the AP, I want to say, yep, same as the Rangers, carrying the same weapons. So... Generally very cost-effective if you want to go, uh, you know, maybe slightly more expensive if you have the extra funds and you're worried about uh, your your infantry getting counterfired or compromised, you might want to opt for the Corlers instead. Corlers with great weapons, you're almost never going to see these guys brought. It's kind of a meme unit, but they're there. Uh, let's see, we'll do Thunderers next. They're sort of your gunners, if you will. They're like quarrelers, except instead of crossbows, they've got guns. So obviously that means armor piercing. Uh, 17 AP per shot with an 11.7 .7 reload time, which is not too bad. Uh, these guys are going to be your bread and butter damage dealers in most builds. Um, you know, between the rangers, the quarrelers, and the thunders. Because your infantry kind of lacks, in a lot of cases, that offensive power, you're going to get most of your damage from your ranged units, which means uh, Thunderers and Rangers for the most part. Uh, Thunderers being the AP variant, so anytime you're going to be up against armored units, like against, uh, you know, Chaos, High Elves, um, just about every matchup is going to probably bring one or two armored units, so having a few Thunderers is almost always a good idea. Uh, as far as gun units go, they are the tankiest um, gun unit, I would say, in the game. Again, 80 armor, shields, so they can definitely outshoot things like hand gunners, uh, zombie, zombie gunnery mobs, things like that. And uh, one last variant of Ranger I forgot to mention. The Bugman's Ranger, probably one of the best skirmisher units in the game. They're a little bit expensive at 750, but if we go ahead and just have a comparison to a regular unit of Rangers, they have much better stats overall, just across the board. 38 melee defense is actually really good, um, just in general. Um, and 24 melee attack is amazing, but more weapon strength, more charge bonus, more ammunition, more damage. That's probably just from a better refire rate, but they have more HP as well, better leadership. Well, Bugman's Rangers also have charge defense versus large, which means if they're facing the unit that's charging them, they'll negate the charge bonus, obviously, which means, you know, units of cavalry, other fast attack units that count as large, note that, like, hounds don't typically, um, but, like, cavalry, for example, if they get in your back line, if they charge these Bugman's Rangers, it's not going to be as impactful as charging a unit of regular Rangers. Not to mention, they're also immune to psychology, and they have regeneration. I mean... What? Like, these guys are just, they've got so much going for them. Uh, this regeneration here means that they are the best counter skirmish unit in the game because they have shields and they have regeneration, which means they can just outshoot you all day, all day and night. And they're not even a regiment of renown, so you can take quite a few of them as well. A super useful unit, one of my favorite units on the Dwarf War Oster. Again, a little bit expensive at 750 but they just have so much going for them. Um, and your last variant of missile unit is a special weapons team known as the Iron Drakes. So these guys are very low in number, only 21 uh, models per unit, but they do a ton of damage. Uh, the regular version has a flamethrower, essentially, that will just mow through infantry, even armored infantry. Uh, it does decent AP now, um, you can see there. Uh, 6 AP with 4... Uh, that's it. Yeah, let's see. How am I supposed to read this? Okay, so 6 <laughs> explosive AP and 4 regular AP with 18 regular and 15 explosive regular, I think. Um, and yeah, it's just... It does a ton of damage, basically. That's what you need to know. Relatively short range, they will just wreck infantry of all kinds, pretty much. Uh, the Iron Drakes with the Troll Hammer torpedoes are going to be your anti-large variant. Rather than shooting like a stream of fire, they just shoot one kind of little torpedo. And it will do a ton of damage, has a huge bonus versus large, and does a ton of armor-piercing damage as well. So, yeah, this unit can tear apart big armored monsters in no time at all. Um, you really, if you see these guys on the field against you, it, you know, if you have heavy cavalry, if you have 
big stompy monsters. Just be aware, these guys will tear you to shreds. So, very strong unit, and pretty underrated in my opinion as well. The Scholar Guard are kind of your uh, regiment round version of the regular Iron Drakes, and they have pure AP. They don't do fire damage, obviously. They have steam guns, basically, um, but they have physical resistance for whatever reason, which is great, um, and they also just do almost pure armor-piercing damage, which is awesome. I have a few really fun replays with these guys um, back on the channel, so if you guys go have a look, but uh, yeah, generally an awesome unit. Now we're moving on to the final parts. We've got flying war machines. This is going to be your only mobility as the dwarves, gyrocopters. So let's talk about gyros for a bit. I think they're kind of crap, to be honest, if we compare them to other flying missile units. Uh, their DPS just isn't there. Uh, the steam guns are okay, but like if we have a, a comparison, and I know deck droppers are still kind of overpowered, but... Uh, like, let's compare them. Deck drop, regular deck droppers are 450, right? So they're they're significantly cheaper. They do less damage, obviously, but they have way more models. So if you were to kind of uh, compare there, yeah, I mean, in total DPS, because the deck droppers have so many more models, they are gonna probably do more damage. Um, I mean, obviously, they aren't as tanky and everything. They don't have the bombs. But just generally, I find the gyrocopters don't do enough damage. They either need more unit models or they need to do more damage. Because their DPS is just kind of subpar compared to a lot of other flying missile units. Um, they do some okay damage. They do have an explosion. Um, but it's not amazing. And the gyrocopters with the brimstone guns do not even have an explosion. And... Um, yeah, they, they do pretty good armor-piercing missile damage, but the refire rate isn't that fast. They have relatively limited ammunition, and there's only three models. So, I mean, that's about 300 damage per volley, whereas your deck droppers are going to be getting significantly more. They have 18 models with 38 total uh, missile damage per shot. So, uh, what is that? 31 of which is armor-piercing? So, yeah. I mean, just as, as a flying missile unit... I kind of understand they were the first flying missile unit in the game, and at the time, Creative Assembly didn't really want to make them too overpowered, but you compare them to Deck Droppers, uh, the Skinks in the Sky, what are they, on Pterodons, um, these bad boys right here, these guys are also better than, uh, than uh, Gyros in my opinion, again, more models, and they either have Poison or an Explosion. And just, they also have a drop rocks ability, which is like the same as the bombs, basically, right? So, they can sh shoot in 360, fire while moving, which is way more useful than your gyrocopters. Even hawk riders, which are not amazing, but they're, they're good in certain situations. They have armor-piercing melee attacks, and, uh, uh, yeah, can fire while moving. They don't shoot 360. But, uh, yeah, again, 18 unit models means that they do a ton more damage. They have 43 <laughs> missile damage per shot. Um, yeah. Well, I guess that's over 10 seconds. But, yeah, just way more DPS than gyrocopters can put out. So, generally, I'm not the biggest fan of gyrocopters. In certain matchups, they are pretty good, though, I will say. Uh, the steam guns in particular, um, I find to be pretty good against low armor infantry factions like Skaven and Beastmen. You can really get some good value from the steam guns shooting at infantry. The brimstone guns, sometimes they're good against armored factions like shooting at cavalry or even armored infantry. They say anti-large, but these things have a hard time hitting single models or monstrous infantry, so that's a little little bit misleading. They also don't have a true bonus versus large, so, you know, take from that what you will. I actually find them to be a lot more effective against armored infantry, so there you go. Uh, the Gyro Bomber is another one that's just... Eh, uh, it's kind of weird. The Missile Attack, I don't know if it does damage. I haven't actually used it in a long time because it's just been so useless for so long that I've kind of given up on it. The Bombs can definitely do a lot of damage if you get them in the right pocket, but it's relatively expensive. This thing's, it's fast, but it's very fragile, so you're going to have a hard time babysitting it against a lot of factions, and just generally I don't find them to be wildly useful. They are a fun unit, it's certainly in campaign, but they're not going to be super competitive in multiplayer unless Creative Assembly changes some things about them, but anyway, that's topic for another video. Moving on to the final bit, we've got artillery. Quite a few artillery choices for the dwarves, and all of them are going to be quite good. Starting with the Lowly Bolt Thrower. Only 550 points, does have pretty short range, but bonus versus large and armor piercing. Uh, decent armor piercing, 116 with a bonus versus large of 30. 
um, you know, decent refire rates as well. A nice, cheap, cost-effective artillery piece, uh, good at counter-firing enemy artillery or shooting at, uh, you know, big monsters or just harassing cav, forcing your opponent to move. Uh, 550 points is actually pretty cheap. You can go nice and wide and still take a couple of these. Uh, grudge throwers are going to be very good against factions which bring armored infantry. Uh, they do good armor piercing damage and are reasonably accurate. The Goblobber is the regiment, regiment of renown version of that. And it has this, uh, let's see here, this discourage effect. I forgot to mention the regiment of renown Skyhammer. It basically just drops all its bombs at once, which isn't even necessarily a benefit. So yeah, that's why I didn't really say anything about that. Because um, it's probably the worst regiment of renown in the game. Um, anyway. The Goblobber is not. Uh, it does have that leadership effect. It actually, I'm sure some of you guys have seen it, but it shoots like goblins tied to rocks. So there you go. Apparently that hurts your leadership. Um, and it is obviously more accurate and has a faster fire rate, being a regiment of renown. The cannon is going to be your bread and butter artillery piece in most matchups. This is kind of your good all around. It says anti large in the tooltip, and make no mistake, it will tear cavalry to shreds if it can land hits on things like chariots it, it, like if all three cannon models hit a chariot model it will one shot it usually so uh, just excellent excellent unit and you're almost always going to have one to two of these depending on the map um, to kind of give you that uh, the anti-large uh, roll and to project your power obviously since you don't have any mobility you know, you kind of have to shoot your enemy mobility away. And the cannon, having 440 range, is one of the best at that. The organ gun has significantly less range, but it does uh, multi-shot and does a ton of armor-piercing missile damage. Um, it's very good against factions, again, which can bring a lot of armored infantry. Although, I'm not as big of a fan because it is more expensive and it has a shorter range. Still can be pretty useful, though, absolutely. Same thing with the Flame Cannon. Again, the Flame Cannon has even more limited range, but this thing shoots, um, like, fireballs, basically, that will do a huge explosion and do a ton of damage. Um, yeah, I don't know if the Flame Cannon's ever going to be competitive, but it is certainly a fun unit, absolutely. And that pretty much finishes up the Dwarf roster. Um, and so you can see just from their, from their unit types, they have, again, no cavalry, extremely limited mobility. They have... Very, very good, very cost-effective infantry skirmishers and infantry, and so that's going to be your bread and butter as the dwarves. So just kind of going through some sample builds real quick. A very common build I've seen these days is to take something like this. You take uh, four dwarf warriors, four to five thunderers, uh, and then you're going to grab some slayers as well, usually the dragonback slayers. Um, and then we'll kind of just buy, buy some miners to act as speed bumps. Maybe we get some with blasting charges to help break up the advance as well. And then from here, we're also going to probably want a rune smith cut down just uh, rune of wrath and ruin. And then we can also grab a single cannon as well. So you can see we're kind of maxing out or trying to max out on what the dwarves can do well. We could even optimize this a little bit further, say cut these thunderers. And maybe we come in here and we're pretty close to being able to afford a second unit of rangers. So maybe we even cut the blasting charges from one of these guys. Uh, I guess we'll have to do both, unfortunately. But uh, that leaves us with a little bit of extra, extra leeway. Maybe we can dump some chevrons into the cannon to make it uh, more accurate. Maybe we dump some chevrons into the rangers to make them a little bit better in melee. Who knows? Some different things you can do. But in general, kind of this uh, super wide Dawi strategy is generally what you're going to want to go for. Uh, you spread your missile units out as much as possible so that if they compromise one missile unit, then the others can turn and shoot. So, like, uh, let's just quickly actually show what a deployment would look like, um, for example. So, we can go ahead and, uh, yeah, we'll go Altdorf outskirts. And we'll go ahead and just do a quick sample deployment. Uh, you know, you can mix and match lords, mix, mix and match key units, but this is kind of the, the idea, is to just go super wide and to flood the body with your cost-effective troops. Uh, again, the lower tier dwarves, just because of their nature, are going to be extremely cost effective because of their armor, their melee defense, and then you can use those, uh, you know, cheap defensive units to hold out and do damage with your, uh, with your uh, ranged units. So, you know, you might put the cannon in a nice defensive position here. I'm going to layer the slayers uh, out towards the back, nice and spread out. So they can kind of respond to various threats as they arise. And then the Dwarf Warriors, we're also going to kind of spread out pretty wide as well. 
just to, to uh, give plenty of uh, firing lanes. Likewise, the miners will kind of uh, spread out a little bit as well. Kind of make some speed bumps up front, and we'll put some out towards the wings also. And let's see, the rangers... Hmm, I'm thinking we put the rangers probably in the center, since they're a little bit squishier. And then kind of spread the thunderers out like this. Sometimes I'll see a lot of dwarf players deploy their thunders in a tighter pocket like this as well. It does make them more vulnerable to chariots and artillery, but they will turn and shoot faster, which is a, a bit of a benefit there. So yeah, something like this where you're just... Because all of your missile units are spread out, like for example, if they were to come in and compromise this unit of thunderers, then all of these rangers, these thunderers, can all turn and shoot at that target, right? And as well, the Slayers can come in and reinforce. And then your Lord, uh, you just want, you know, wherever to tie things up. And, uh, yeah, the Runesmith can kind of be in the center to help uh, slow things down as well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert by any means. I don't play Dwarves super often, but I know Turin's been playing the Dwarves quite a bit recently. I've been featuring a lot of uh, A-Move Hacker and, uh, and Shetland Apache. Both of them are very good Dwarf players, I would say, as well. And this is kind of the tips that I've picked up from them, is you just go super wide and uh, you try and use your, your ranged units to really deal out the damage. Of course, the Slayers can deal out a ton of damage too in the right situation, but uh, yeah. And if you're fighting the Dwarves, then obviously you can understand that you're 9 times out of 10 going to have the mobility advantage, unless you're playing like Vampire Coast or something. Um, and yeah, you're going to need units that can deal with armored infantry, obviously. So, uh, because the dwarves don't have any uh, high mass units or anything like that, they are somewhat vulnerable to, uh, to chariots. So we're going to go ahead and back out of this here and quickly just uh, run to the custom battle screen one more time. Uh, of course, again, the bane of dwarves for a long time has been chariots, and that is still true to a degree, although with some of the speed debuffs they have, it can be a bit risky to take chariots, but they can definitely, uh, they can definitely do a lot of work here, especially single entity chariots. It's like if we go to Norska here. Uh, where are they? Here they are. Like, uh, for example, this is probably one of the the most painful examples for the dwarves. Wolfric on his chariot has bonus versus infantry, he has armor piercing, 90 charge bonus, and being on a chariot means he's basically impossible for the dwarves to catch. Uh, you're gonna have to be extremely lucky with some cannon shots or just very patient and focused with your ranged attacks. Uh, you know, it's certainly not impossible to take chariots down, but they are going to be one of your biggest threats. Uh, big armored monsters can be sometimes kind of scary, but generally you'll have the firepower to deal with them relatively effectively. And then of course, uh, just being able to deal with great weapon infantry of all variants and all kinds. Um, everyone's going to try and bring armor piercing against you, right? Because you have armored infantry, so... Um, when you're fighting the dwarves, again, another another uh, key, and you'll see this in a lot of my replays when I'm fighting against the dwarves, is disruption. Uh, you've got to get in that back line and muck up their missile units and keep them from shooting as much as possible, because that's primarily where their damage is going to come from, is from those missile units. The other thing you have to be aware of is, obviously, Slayers being unbreakable uh, means that you're going to have to kill all of them, <laughs> pretty much. Um, so you want to make sure you're aware with your large... Uh, you know, units that count as large, units that are high value and expensive. If you see Slayers coming, you know, just soak them in with something cheap. Uh, run in some cheap, you know, Marauder Infantry if you're playing uh, Norska or if you're playing Bretonia. You run, run some Peasants in there to soak the hits uh, because Slayers, they will chop through Chaff, absolutely, but it's not super cost effective for them to do so, uh, especially if you can get like a decent mid-tier defensive unit, something like Graveguard, they will just tear apart slayers for uh you know very very cost effectively uh decent armor you know bonus versus infantry this is again kind of a worst case scenario but even something like a battle pilgrim or uh, i'm trying to think of another uh decent even like empire swordsmen um really are going to be a terrible i mean empire swordsmen are just an excellent unit overall but um they're going to be a terrible trade for slayers because they have good melee stats and the slayers don't have any armor so, yeah, um, that's that's the one thing to be aware of when you're fighting against the dwarves, is you've got to have some units available to deal with slayers. Um, and then the other important thing, again, is to occupy their ranged units. Whether or not you're dealing damage to them, 
you just have to keep them from firing as much as possible. Uh, that's the most important thing. So, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this overview of the dwarves. Hopefully you found it informative. It's, holy cow, almost an hour long now at this point. So, I was planning for this to be a nice quick video, but... I tend to ramble a bit, if you haven't noticed, so hopefully you guys were able to stay awake through all this and uh, found it interesting, informative, or at least learned one or two new things. Uh, yeah, if you guys like this sort of content, be sure to like, subscribe. I've got a whole playlist of these overviews, and uh, so you feel free to check out those. And let me know in the comments down below what faction you would like me to do next. I'm considering Dark Elves and High Elves probably is the next two. I may throw up a poll in, in the coming days, so watch for that as well. But thanks anyway for watching once again. And we'll see you next time.